working with input using scanf function. In this lecture, we will learn how to use scanf to read user input from the command line. We will also become familiar with how scanf works and understand its constraints and limitations. So let's get started. Scanf function takes a format string and a variable number of arguments, just similar to printf. The only difference is that printf prints output to the standard output stream, whereas scanf reads data from the standard input stream. Let's look at some of the important scanf type field characters that we care about. The first one is the C character, and the variable that it expects as an argument is a pointer to a character. Here's an example. You can say scanf percentage C, and you give it an address of a variable that's a character type. In that case, scanf will read the next input from the input stream and pass it on to your variable. The next one that we care about is called D, which is for decimal integer. This only accepts decimal integers, it does not accept hexadecimal. In this case, to use it, we can say scanf percentage d and we give it the pointer to an integer variable because this is going to be an output parameter. Similar to d is the i character. In this case, it's also an integer but can be both decimal or hexadecimal. So an example would be scanf percentage i, the address of i, in this case integer i, is going to be holding the value from the user input whether it's in decimal or hexadecimal. In the case of hexadecimal, the first few characters of the input determine whether it's decimal or hexadecimal. And the last one we care about is the S for strings. This is used for character arrays, including spaces. We use S to get strings from the input stream, but make sure that whenever you define it, you have an additional space for the null character. So for example here, we can say scanf percentage S name, where we have defined character name of 21 characters. The first form here is completely fine, except that it's not recommended. One that's really recommended is you specify the maximum number of characters allowed. In this case, scanf percentage 20s means that the maximum numbers you read from the input stream, even though it may have more, is going to be 20. And then scanf understands that the buffer is big enough to hold 20 plus one additional for the null character. So always make sure your buffer has one extra byte for the null character. What are the requirements for using scanf? The first thing to notice is that you have to include standard IO.h so that you can use scanf, just like printf. One security note here is that scanf has been deprecated as not secure. In order to use the older version of the function scanf, you would have to define this macro, CRT secure no warnings. So once we define CRT secure no warnings, that means we can use the old version of the function. However, it is recommended to use the scanf underscore s or any of the similar ones in here to get the input from the scanf. In the next lecture, we will jump into Visual Studio and start writing some code using scanf. So see you in the next lecture. Okay, so here I am in Visual Studio. Let's go ahead and create a new project. Click on File New Project. And then make sure you have from this page 132 selected and then 132 console application. Let's name this one scanf. Click OK. On this page, click Next. On this page, make sure you have empty project selected, then click Finish. Right click on Source Files, Add New Item, and let's call it main.c. Then click Add. All right, so let's define a char array name of 21. Then let's prompt the user to enter their name. NF, I please enter your name. I'm going to add a space here at the end. I'm not going to add a new line character. And the reason is that I want the caret to be on the same line as the prompt. So the user can type next to it. So let's say scanf percentage s. As I said before, it's better to say 20 s. That way we can limit the input to exactly 20 characters. Okay, so let's try to print it out. Let's say print f i percentage s. Nice to meet you, for example a new line character and let's do name. So let's try to compile this and see the error we're going to get because we're using the deprecated scanf function here. Control shift B on the keyboard. You will see that I'm getting an error here and it says that this function is not safe. Consider using scanf underscore s or here it says to disable deprecation use this macro. So I'm going to use the macro for now. Let's just copy this. So up here before our include and say hash define this macro. 
once it's defined, it's going to suppress that warning. Ctrl Shift B again. Okay, so now it's successful. So let's try to run it. Ctrl F5. Now it's asking me for my name. Please enter your name, Mohammed. Now it says, hi, Mohammed. Nice to meet you. All right, so that's how we get the username from the input. Let's see how we get an integer. Let's prompt the user for their age. Please enter. You can also say percentage s comma name. This way we can print the username as well. Okay, so let's say scan f percentage d for decimal address of age. Okay, I defined integer age so I can get the value here. Ctrl Shift B. So now let's copy this and say so please tell me, are you male or female? You can say here, MF. In this case, we're going to ask for a percentage C and then add the gender variable here, which is going to be of type char gender. And finally, let's print out everything we learned about the user. You can say percentage S, you are a percentage S who is percentage d years old we could say her name and then we want to check the gender is equal to m or gender is equal to small letter m that's the case we're going to say male otherwise we can say female probably better to put each one on a single line so i'm going to do this here and do this here so that it's easier to read and the last thing we want to display is the age of this user. So this is how we print out the result. Let's give this a try. Control F5. Yes, I want to run. Okay. Hi, please enter your name. I'm going to say Muhammad. Hi, Muhammad. Nice to meet you. Muhammad, please enter your age. I'm going to say 35. Enter. As you can see here, it skipped my third prompt, which is asking me for whether I'm male or female. And the reason is that... Scanf is not very good with input streams. It does not differentiate between the white space and the characters that you actually type. So if there's any remaining like new line character space or tab in the input buffer stream, it's going to actually use that and put it in your char C here. So one way to avoid this is to actually add an extra space here before the percentage C. As you can see, I just added an extra space. What this tells scanf, it tells it that to skip all the white space, all the new line characters, line feeds, spacebar, or even tabs. This is one way to avoid this problem. However, still, scanf has a lot of issues with input stream. It doesn't know how to handle it. In the next lecture, I'm going to show you a way where we can actually flush out the input stream so that scanf doesn't cause these kind of problems. But for now, let's just use this technique. And let's run again. Control F5. Yes. Okay. Again, enter your name, Mohammed. Enter your age is going to be 35. Now it's asking me, and it's not getting affected by the input stream data. So now it says, Tell me, are you male or female? I'm going to say, M. Mohammed, you are a male who is 35 years old. So you can see here, this is how we use scanf to prompt the user for input using console applications. So the last thing I want to mention here is that this check here is actually only checking for male or female. What I want to say here is that this trainer operator here does not check for all possible values. It could be that the user could enter on the keyboard anything but M, right? Like it doesn't have to be F. They can enter X, Y, Z, whatever. And we will assume that if it's not M, it's a female. Typically, this is not the way I would handle this in real products because you need to check for both M and F to make sure that you have correct input from the user. However, this is just a quick example. So I just wanted to point out that we have to do better error and input validation in our programs. All right, that's it for this lecture. See you in the next lecture. Working with input, important tips. In this lecture, we will look at how to work around input function limitations. We will look at some ways to clear the input buffer and also consider better ways to handle user input. The goal of this lecture is to see how we can handle user input more gracefully and handle errors. Okay, how to flush the input buffer when you're using scanf function. I'm showing you here two different ways you can do that. In the previous lecture, we saw a problem with the scanf function where some residual input in the input buffer stream could cause the next scanf to just get some data out of that buffer and not give you the data you expect the user to input. 
So one technique to avoid that is to use a function like this so that you can clear the input buffer stream. So here, as you can see, I'm defining a char C. So we have a while loop that reads one character at a time out of the input stream and assign that value to C. And as long as it's not the new line character and we don't encounter an end of file, which means that there's no more data in the input buffer stream, then we keep continuing to skip that value. So basically this actually extracts out all the remaining values in the input buffer stream until there's no more data to be handled. So this is a good function to call right before you're calling your scanf function. However, this function may not be used if you haven't used scanf before because this git char, if there's nothing in the user input buffer stream, it will actually prompt the user to get the next character. So you don't want to use this unless you have used scanf at least one time before you use this. Another technique that doesn't have this issue is as shown in this next function that I'm writing here, which basically uses the file seek mechanism, but it passes in instead of a file name or a file pointer, it's using the standard input as a file because the standard input stream can be treated as a file. So here we're saying that seek into the standard input stream from the beginning pointer all the way to the end. So this means that skip everything in the input buffer stream, go all the way to the end. So that means it will actually skip all the data that's currently in the buffer stream. Final note on scanf function, if you read on the web or if you read in some documentation books, you will see that many people are telling you to avoid using this function altogether. Even though scanf can be used in examples like we wrote already during this course, I don't think you can use it without really understanding how this function works. You really need to understand how it works, make sure you handle its return error code, make sure you understand the limitations of this function, and then when you really master this function, then feel free to use it in code that you want to ship to customers. But if you're writing just simple test apps, I think it's fine to use it. And again, if you know how to use it well, then I don't think there's any harm in using it. If you have tested your code enough and you know how exactly it works, then you could consider using it. So continuing on that, always check for errors by looking at the return code, whether it's a scanf function or any other function, you should always consider looking at the return code. But in this case, I'm just focusing on scanf. So as you can see on success, the number of items that are passed in is returned as an indication of success. So in this example, here we say, please enter your name and we pass in one item. That means return should give us back one on success. If any value returned other than one, that should be considered as an error. Something went wrong. Also, scanf can return an end of file error, which is a minus one. I think it's a hard coded value, but you can use this macro, this value here to replace that. So also documentation says you can use this function file in the file give it the standard input as file pointer it will tell you whether in the file was hit or not another function to consider is file error you give it the standard input file pointer it will tell you whether there has been an error or not so these are ways to see if the user has caused any input error or something went wrong definitely always check for errors check for return code okay so if scanf has so many issues what else can we do? Other functions that exist in the C runtime, like get string underscore s, which is the secure version, and file get string. Consider using these functions for your input. So here's an example of how to use get s underscore s. If you read the documentation or you read on the web, a lot of people will tell you never to use get s, the not secure version. This was an older version and it never was accepting the buffer size. So this could easily cause buffer overruns because whatever the user types, if it's more than the buffer you define, it's going to cause you issues. However, get s underscore s is a secure version it will not allow more than the maximum size here you have to be input into the buffer so it won't cause any memory problems. So use get s underscore s. The nice thing about this is that it reads out the whole line from the input stream and gives you back what you ask for. Again, this one can also fail. Check for return code. If it returns null, that means something went wrong. You can check again with the file in the file function. You can check file error for more details. Get s allows you to read a line of text at a time. You can parse the line to read its value. The advantage of this is that you can detect errors in the input and handle them as you see fit. As you get more mature as a developer, 
this is a better way for you to handle the input and to make sure that you parse it yourself and look for certain things you want in the code finally never use get s because it's considered dangerous it can cause buffer overruns it can cause a lot of issues so never use that one always use the underscore s secure version in fact if you try with visual studio you will not find this thing defined you will only find this one defined inside standard io.h because they took it out because it's really a dangerous function preprocessor directives in this section we will learn about the preprocessor directives how to use them and what they are used for let's start with the definition what is exactly meant by preprocessor directives the preprocessor directives such as hash define and hash include and ftf are simply used to make source programs easy to change and easy to compile into different execution environments for example they can be used to insert the contents of another file into the source file and that's an example of the hash include or maybe you can suppress compilation of parts of your code by using some of the conditional compilation directives. So let's get started on some of these and learn how to use the hash define, the hash fdef, and more of the preprocessor directives as we continue through this section. Preprocessor directives. The hash define preprocessor directive. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to use the hash define. Let's start off with a definition. The hash define is one of the preprocessor directives that's usually used to create some symbolic constants or some macros. An example of a symbolic constant is the hash define debug build. In this example, we define a new constant, a new symbol called debug build that becomes something that is known to the preprocessor. Another example like build version and give it a value here. Notice that in the first case we don't give it any value, it just becomes something that is defined, something that is known to the preprocessor. In the second case, this becomes another name for this value. Think of it as this is like a synonym for this value. So wherever build version is used, the compiler or preprocessor is going to replace it with this value before it starts compiling your code. Macros. That's the second thing we can use hash define for. Here's an example. We can say hash define is true and you give it an argument here. And then you define your macro the way you want. So in this example, I'm going to say that if anybody pass me a value here and I say this is not equal to zero, then that's the definition of is true. So in short, the hash define can be used to define a symbolic constant like this or a macro. And the way to tell by looking at your code, which one is a macro, which one is a symbolic constant, by looking at whether it has one or more arguments if it has no arguments it's called a symbolic constant if it has one or more arguments then it's a macro so macro means it requires an argument to be passed to it when you call it also one thing to notice is that we usually use all capital case when we give names and constants to our macros or our symbolic constants and this is just a convention you can use whatever you want, but this is the standard. This is the convention that people use. So if you want other people to read your code and quickly figure out that this is a macro, you should follow the same convention. Let's take another example of a macro. Hash define max. This one takes two arguments. Let's say we want to always get the maximum of two arguments. Then we say max of a, b. And the way we implement it, we say if a is greater than b, return a, otherwise return b. Of course, in this case, there is no return. This is going to be a text substitution. The first thing the compiler does when you compile your code, it replaces all the preprocessor directives with their actual values. So that's the step that happens before compilation. And then it generates a new temp file that gets compiled. And I'll show you that as we start working with Visual Studio. In the next lecture, let's switch over to Visual Studio and try to use hash define to define some symbols, some macros, and also learn about some of the gotchas and some of the things that you can fall into when you're using with hash define and if you're not very careful how you define your constants and macros. Okay, so here I am in Visual Studio. Let's go ahead and create a new project. Click on File New Project and then make sure from this list you have Visual C++ selected and then from that Let's select Win32, and then go here and select Win32 console application. I'm going to call this project using define. 
click OK, click Next, and make sure you select Empty Project because we don't want to create a C++ project. Click Finish. All right, let's add our main.c file. Right click on Source Files, Add, and then click on New Item. Call this main.c, click Add. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to learn how to use the hash define in our C and C++ programs. Let's say we want to print out something like this, printf, welcome to my program, version 1. And let's say you don't want to always hard code it like this, right? This is where hash define comes in handy. Instead, you can say something like this, I want to give it a string, but that string, I don't want it to be a variable in memory. It's a compile time thing, I can just define it here. So that's where I can say hash define program version, for example, to be 100. Now we can use it in here, program version, because it's defined. And this is how I can use it in my program. So this is why constants are useful. Instead of defining a variable in memory, which you have to keep it in memory at runtime, in this case, this is something that we only need one time. Instead of using a variable, we use the preprocessor to define this, which after compilation, this is going to go away. Only this value is used in its place. And since this is using printf, we have to actually include standard io.h. Let's try it out. Control F5 to compile and run. As you can see now, welcome to my program version 100. And I have a typo in my version. I have to fix the typo. Okay. Let's launch a command window. First thing, I'm going to copy the location of my file. Right click on the file name, copy full path. Okay, and now let's launch the command prompt, cmd. Make sure to select developer command prompt for VS 2015 because that has the path to our actual compiler. If you remember from previous lectures, the command line compiler was cl.exe or just cl for short. And as you can see, this is now running my C, C++ optimizing compiler from Microsoft. And if I say cl over slash question mark, this will give me a list of the help commands it has. As you can see, this is the preprocessor section. It says or slash capital E preprocess to standard output. This means strip out all the preprocessor stuff into the standard output. And also we can say EP. This is the same except that it doesn't produce any hash line tags in the output. And by default, it actually strips out all the comments. So if you say forward slash C, do not strip my comments. If you remember that the comments are not part of the executable that you generate, and this is why it gets stripped out. But if you want to keep them and just look at them, you can say forward slash C. Okay, so let's go to our directory where this file is. I'm going to paste it here. And notice that it has the file name in there. I'm going to take it out. Okay. Now I'm inside the same directory as my main.c file. Let's expand the window a little bit. Let's try to compile it. CL main.c will actually compile, as you can see, and generate our main.exe. All right, we said we don't want to compile. We just want to like to see how the preprocessor stuff gets removed. So we can say cl forward slash e main.c. This will generate everything on the command line. Wow, there's a lot of output being generated. And the reason is because we have included the standard IO here. So as you can see now, there's hash line five. This means this is where your program starts. And then as you can see, the comments are gone. All the stuff that we hash defined are no longer there. If you notice, the program version is gone. Instead, its actual value is here. So this is the file that gets compiled from this version into the machine executable version. I'm going to comment out the hash include here to simplify our life a little bit. Save that. I'm back in my command window. Let's run this again. And this time it should be a lot faster because we have nothing to include. All right, so line one is where it starts, main.c. All the comments are gone and all the preprocessor stuff is gone. So let's do forward slash c to keep the comments in there. Okay, now you can see this is my comment. This is the line that we commented out. The constants are still there. However, everything that has a hash or a pound at the start of the line is gone because the preprocessor strip it out and put in its place a string substitution of the values. This is how the preprocessor works. And like I said in the previous lecture, the first step before compilation is that it strips out all your preprocessor directives first and then does a substitution and then this file is the modified code that gets compiled. 
let's try another example here let's try to define something else for example hash define print count five okay let's use that here for integer i equals zero i is less than print count plus plus i and then i'm gonna i'm just gonna indent this to the right let's compile and run oh first we have to uncomment the standard io stuff compile and run control f5 yes so now it's actually printing out my statement five times on the command line let's comment this out again and go back to the command line here and i just want to show you how this actually gets same thing it's actually now using five instead of that count that we defined you will find the command line step very useful when you run into situations where your macros or, or constants are causing you some issues in the code this is a nice tab where you can go and look at the actual generated file and figure out for yourself what's happening in fact we will see that in the next lecture when we talk about defining macros so see you in the next lecture hash define in the previous lecture we talked about hash define and we saw how we can define some constant symbols using hash define in this lecture we will talk about how to define macros and some of the gotchas things you need to be aware of when you start using hash define to define your own macros so let's jump right into visual studio and get started okay so here i am in visual studio i'm going to use the project from the previous lecture if you don't have it open make sure to go to file recent projects and solutions and it's going to be called using define.sln make sure you have this one open okay i'm going to make a few simple changes here i'm going to get rid of this constant here and this for loop we just want to print out this statement once on the screen today we want to learn how to use hash define to define macros unlike the constants here where you don't pass any arguments the macros allow you to actually pass arguments that you can actually work with so let's say for example some a and b if we define this macro as the following a plus b and then come here somewhere and let's assign a value to the variable c integer c equals sum and let's do 10 20. then after that we can print out the result to the screen sum equals percentage d a new line character and then we can here give it c so let's try to compile this Control f5 on the keyboard click yes and as you can see here welcome to my program this is from the previous lecture and now it says sum equals 30. this is an example of how we can use the hash define to define a macro like this one sum that takes two arguments let's try another example let's do a max macro that takes also a and b or we can give it just x and y this is actually not a variable it's just anything you want if x is greater than y return x otherwise return y okay so let's see how we can use this one right now max of percentage d and percentage d is percentage d give it 10 20 max of 10 20. okay let's compile and run i'm gonna hit ctrl f5 on my keyboard like yes and let's see this it says max of 10 and 20 is 20 correct okay all right so now let's look at how we can actually get into trouble with with the hash define for macros let's say we want to do a multiplication multiply a and b in this case we're going to say a times b okay let's try this example 10 plus 2 times so we define our macro here multiply a with b so it says a times b so if you look at this you might think that okay i'm gonna multiply 12 by 10 which should give me 120 but let's see what this thing actually does for us as a result let's figure out x is what okay let's say here type x for me please ctrl f5 to compile okay let's look at x here x is actually 30 hmm. but i think we thought it was going to be 12 times 10 but what exactly is happening actually if you remember this is the macro expansion or substitution removes all this and put in its place this value in fact let's go to the command line i have my command prompt here so i'm gonna actually do the same thing the same trick clep main.c so because i have my include standard io it's gonna spit out everything inside that file let's ignore that let's look at this here this is what we care about 
So you can see integer x equals 10 plus 2 times 10. Interesting. So what's going on here? We thought it was going to be 12 times 10, but instead it's 10 plus 2 times 10. All right, so that probably should tell you how you can get into trouble with this macro expansion thing. So you would think it's going to do this, then this, but in reality, the macro expansion is very dumb. It doesn't understand anything. It just It's just a matter of text substitution. So it comes in here, treats this as an A, and treats this as a B. So what happens is it does it like this. X equals, okay, you give me 10 plus 2 as A. Okay, I'll do that times 10 is the another argument, which is B. This is exactly what it does. Don't think it's acting as a function. It is not a function. This is a macro. Macro expansion is completely different from function calls. If this was a function call, this would be evaluated first and passed in as an argument to the function. But since this is a macro, it's simply a text substitution. So that's what's happening here. All right, so since this is an issue here, how do we avoid such issues in the in the future when we write our macros? Always use the parentheses like this. You could do something like this to guard yourself against any problems of this sort. So if you write your macro this way, now let's give it a try. Control F5. Okay, now, so we see now X is equal 120. So this is the correct behavior as we expected. Now, this is all because we actually used parentheses here so that when this gets evaluated, no side effects will happen. This is why they always encourage you to do something like this around all your parameters for the macro. That way, you don't get into any sort of side effects. And then finally here, something like this. And to be extra safe, we could do something like this. All right, so I hope this clarifies how to define macros and how to be aware of some of the gotchas with macros. Two more things I want to talk about before we finish this. The first thing is always try to favor functions over macros. For example, this macro here, I'd rather have you moving forward for new code, especially as you move to, to our C++, to have inline functions instead. You could say inline integer max, integer a, integer b, and you can say if a is greater than b, return a, else return b. So this is an inline function. The advantage to inline function is that it's strongly typed because you see here we have the type for the parameters. There's no side effects like we could have with the macros. And since this is inline, you rely on the compiler to say that if this function is too small, it could possibly, instead of writing a function call, it would generate the assembly for inlining this, meaning that it will treat it as if you were writing this if statement yourself into the code wherever you call it. But however, since you're going to be working with a lot of legacy code, I think you it's good to also understand macros and also be aware of some of the issues with macros. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is also on this function versus macro side effects. Another side effect with this macro here is that you could potentially get into trouble if you do something like this. If you say integer a equals then b equals 20, then we say integer r equals max of plus plus a plus plus b guess what's going to happen here since this is not a function this is a macro it's going to get this whole line here in fact let me just do that on the command line for you and then let's say printf r equals percentage d let's compile and run okay, as you can see r is 22 hmm. even though we increment b once here why is it 22 well it's again because of the macro expansion see here we have y is representing b it's shown twice here. That means it will check here and increment it. And as it returns, it also increments it. So in fact, let's look at the command line to see the same problem. As you can see here, R equals plus plus A greater than plus plus B. If that's true, return plus plus A. Otherwise, it's plus plus B. So as you can see, B is being incremented twice. And sometimes you might actually spend hours and hours trying to figure out what's going on here. This is because of the macro side effect. Let's see how the function actually is safer in this case. Let's use our function max here, which is this guy. And this should hopefully increment b only once and a only once. So let's run this. So as you can see, r equals 21. It did exactly what we expect. It just increments this once. And after that, this becomes a local variable in the function. It doesn't do anything with it. So that's another reason why functions are safer than macros. I hope this gives you a good idea about how to define macros and how to avoid their side effects. All right, that's it for now. 
in the next lecture we'll continue talking about more preprocessor directives so see you in the next lecture Hash include preprocessor directive. We've probably used this so many times in the projects we've been building so far. In short, the hash include is used to copy the content of one file into the other. So we've been using this a lot to bring into our source files the content from other files. Let's look at some examples. Okay, the first example here, hash includes standard io.h or standard input output.h. Notice how we use angle brackets in here. Another way to use this hash include is by using quotation marks. And there is a difference between the two forms. And these are usually compiler dependent. So each compiler vendor would implement them differently. But they kind of follow a similar pattern. There are other ways you can also include files. Like hash include in this format. Dot dot. This form is using relative path. Which is usually relative to the current directory or some location that your folder structure is based on. This is slightly okay, but it's not recommended, especially if you become part of a big team and when you want to move your code from one location to the other, this becomes a maintenance nightmare. The last form, which is highly unrecommended, nobody likes to use this unless you work on a single project by yourself, not part of a team, because other team members may not have the project on the same folder as this. Somebody might have it on a D drive or a different folder. There's no need to do this. Once you understand how to organize your files into folders and your projects into certain folders, you really don't need to do this. Okay, so the first example of how we can use hash include is with angle brackets. Like this example, angle brackets file name .h. Let's look at how the preprocessor actually process the file and find the location of your file if you use angle brackets. First, it will look along the path specified by each slash i compiler option, which refers to additional include directories. So the second location it starts looking for it is using the include environment variable. This is the same as include directories in Visual Studio. So if the file is not found here, it's not found here, it will give you an error. If the file cannot be found by using either of these two approaches, you will probably get a compilation error file not found. So your file has to be in one of these locations when you use the angle brackets. Hash include quotation marks. The second form you would include a file is by using quotation marks like this. We usually use this for our own header files. The advantage to this one is that it always looks first in the same directory as the source file including your header file. So if my source file is inside C colon slash my folder, then it would assume that my header file is also in the same directory. This makes it easy for you to have your header files in the same folder as your source files. If your header file is not in the same directory, then Visual Studio moves on to step number two. And this is taken from MSDN. MSDN says that Visual Studio will start looking in the directories of the currently open include files in the reverse order in which they were opened. The search begins in the directory of the parent include file continues upwards through the directories of any grandparent include files. So it keeps looking there. And if it doesn't find it, then it jumps to the third step where it will be looking for your include file along the paths that you specify with the forward slash i command line option. Or you can do it via Visual Studio IDE if you're not using the command line compiler but from within Visual Studio IDE, you will be using the additional include directory setting. Now, if Visual Studio still cannot find your include file, then the last step the compiler will do is it will look at the include environment variable, assuming again you're using the command line compiler, it will start searching all directories specified in the include environment variable. Similarly, if you're using the Visual Studio IDE, then it will use the include directory setting to search all directories specified in that dialog. So the main takeaway is that the quotation marks one is really useful for you to include your own header files. So use this one when you have your own header files because they usually tend to be in the same directory as your source files and use the hash include angle brackets for all other files that you want them to be either in additional include directories or inside include directories.
Let's look at additional include directories. We specify additional include directories on the command line using the slash i parameter when you compile files. And this basically says, look for my include files inside these locations as well. So here's an example, command line compiler forward slash i hash include. So this is saying that hash include is another place to look for header files inside it. Also slash i my include is another location to look for header files that are being included by main.c. So if main.c includes files, it will include these locations as part of the search process. So this is how it looks for it. If you use hash include with quotation marks, it will start looking in the same directory. And then if it doesn't find it, it goes to the location specified by forward slash i, which is hash include and hash my include. And finally, if your files are not in here, it will look at the include environment variable. If it's not found in any of these locations, you will get file not found error. Similar to hash i on the command line, you can specify the same values here inside Visual Studio by going to Project Properties C++ General. You can see from this dialog here, if you go to C++ General, the first value here, additional include directories, this is where you specify additional directories to search for include files inside them. Include directories. You can also use the environment variable include to specify additional directories to look for files. This is an example, D, MSVC, include, semicolons, C, my includes, etc. You can just put semicolons and continue adding stuff. And then when you compile your program, it will start also looking in these directories for include files. If you're not on the command line, alternatively, you can do the same thing using Visual Studio. Basically, you go to your project properties, you get this dialog, and then you click on Visual C++ directories. Here you can see include directories. And this is where you can actually specify additional include directories using Visual Studio. All right, so that's it for this lecture. So see you in the next lecture. The Conditional Compilation Preprocessor Directives. In this lecture, we will look at conditional compilation with the following preprocessor directives, hash if, hash if diff, and hash if and diff. So let's get started. So what is conditional compilation? It's a way to allow the compiler to produce different code and different executables that is controlled by some parameters you provide during compilation. This is useful for targeting different platforms or different versions of libraries you want to implement or even to target specific hardware. So some of the ways we can use it. The first one is by using hash if statement and the second one is by using the hash if diff and the last one, which is kind of the opposite of if diff, is the if not diff. I'm going to recommend to you that you use this format here because this is the new way of doing it in C, C++. The last two here are simply kept for backward compatibility with older versions of the C compiler. You will see a lot of existing code that use this format here, if diff and if in diff. However, for new code that you want to write, it's recommended that you use and follow the hash if directive. Or you can use the defined and not defined macros that can help you detect if something is defined or not defined. Let's take a look at some examples so that we can understand this more. Okay, the first one is the hash if. A good example where this could be useful is you say if trace level is greater than one, it's looking at the value of some constant symbol something that you defined and if that happens to be greater than one the dot 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 refers to some code that you could potentially compile if this was true so if trace level is greater than one it will actually compile this code so the end if is needed because you need to tell the preprocessor which statements belong to this f block another example which uses the else which is optional you can say Ash if trace level, for example, is greater than 2, compile some code. If it wasn't greater than 2, you can say hash else, compile this other code. And then at the end, close the whole section of the hash if and if. Let's continue to look at another example. In this example, we can say if trace level is exactly 0, you can compile some code here. Else if, this is where you kind of see, instead of using else if, 
the preprocessor actually has an LF so that you nest multiple F with else F statements. So if it's zero, compile this code, else if it's one, compile this code, else it's not zero or one, then compile this code for me. Now let's talk about the defined, not defined macros and how they can be useful. Sometimes you just want to define a constant symbol without giving it a value. In the lecture on hash define, where we define symbolic constants, we saw how we can define something without giving it a value, like hash define trace enabled. So the defined macro, not defined macro, is useful when you want to check if something is defined for the preprocessor or not. We want to enable tracing. This is an example. So we would say, if define trace enabled, compile some tracing statements in here, log some statements to a file, etc., or spit out some tracing information to the output somewhere on the screen. You know, basically print out some tracing information. Else tracing is not enabled, then we can do the code that doesn't require tracing. Also, if we want to see if, for example, something is not defined, in that case we say, if not defined trace file, then maybe we can say, okay, now we don't have a trace file, maybe we should display the output on the screen, or maybe tell the user something that, hey, the trace file is not defined, etc. So that's how you can use defined and not defined. For the sake of completeness, we're going to Talk about fdef because you will encounter this in a lot of existing code and you want to understand how it works. In this example, fdef windows is simply the same as when you use hash f defined windows. Notice that, for example, here windows has been defined. We say define windows. In this case, this will be true. So the code is written here is going to actually compile. Else, if this was not defined, then this code would be compiled instead. This is useful for targeting different platforms or different hardware, as we mentioned before. Imagine that you have code that only runs on Windows and other code only runs on Mac or Linux. Then you can say, if we're compiling on Windows, go ahead and compile this code. Else, if we're compiling on, for example, Linux or Mac, compile this code. Again, for legacy purposes, fdef still exists in the C++ compiler. It is recommended that you use the F defined instead when you write your new code. Next is the F not defined. In this example, let's say if we want to target the Mac compilation. We can do it this way as well. We can say define Mac. If not defined Mac, this means that this is not a Mac. It could be Windows or Linux. Else, this is a Mac. Go ahead and compile the Mac version of the code. So that's how we use if not defined. All right, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will jump into Visual Studio so we can practice some of the stuff we learned in this lecture. Conditional Compilation Preprocessor Directives Let's jump right into Visual Studio to understand how to use fdefined, not defined, and the f0 trick that's helpful for commenting out large chunks of code. Here I am in Visual Studio. Let's create a new project. Click on File New Project. Make sure you have Visual C++ Win32 selected. Select Win32 console application and let's call this one conditional example. Click OK. On this page, click Next. Make sure you have empty project selected and click Finish. Let's add our main.c. Right click on source files, add new item, and type here main.c. Click Add. OK, in today's lecture, we're going to learn about conditional compilation and how we can use the preprocessor to help us compile some code or not compile certain code. OK, let's try a simple example so that we don't complicate things. Let's assume we want to say hi to the user based on their platform they use. So let's say if they're on Windows, we're going to print f hello Windows. And if they're actually running on Mac, we want to say print f hello on Mac. New line here. Hello on Linux, for example. So let's see how we can do that with the conditional compilation. I don't want to print all three. I just want to, based on the environment I'm in, I want to basically print the write message. So let's say define windows here. So the way to do that, we can say here, if defined windows, do this, else if defined Mac, do this, dash else defined Linux, do this. You have to do end if so that you can close this whole section. 
And notice that Visual Studio can actually collapse these here for you. Also notice that Visual Studio is actually showing the ones that are not defined in a slightly dimmed color. You can see this one is actually highlighted whereas these ones are dimmed in color. Slightly grayed out because this is not defined, this is not defined, and this is not defined. So only Windows is defined. So if we compile and run this, Ctrl F5 on the keyboard, as you can see now it says hello Windows because it only knows about Windows. If we go ahead and change this to Mac, assuming that we are on a Mac, immediately you can see this is the one that's highlighted now. Everything else is grayed out. Okay, Ctrl F5 to compile and run. Now it's saying hello Mac. And the last thing we say Linux, Ctrl F5 to compile and run. So now we're getting the Linux message. And of course you can put multiple statements here, as many as you want. We can call functions, etc. So as you can see. And lastly, we can just not define anything. In that case, the else condition is the one that's actually going to be the one that's active. Okay, so that's basically how you use defined with the conditional preprocessor statements. This is going to be very useful when you try to compile code that's cross-platform, based on different versions, based on different languages, based on different hardware, etc. Now let's remove this and talk about when you need to use this for commenting out certain code. Let's assume we have like for integer i equals 0, i is less 100, plus i, and say nf. Okay, let's assume we have code like this. And for some reason, you would want to comment out some code without having to use the comment. You can always come in here and say like things like this. For example, you can say F0, do this, hash and if. This has the same effect as commenting out code because 0 is never defined. And if you do F0, that means you're basically saying, I don't want this code to compile. I don't want this code to run. There will be cases where commenting out code could mean also commenting out a lot of code but sometimes there will be something that you could still want to comment out parts of it and not all of it you can do something like this or you can quickly try something that's slightly different than what you had before and just keeping the old code as is you can say for example here i plus one this will be useful when you have large code bases and you want to quickly just comment something out I've seen cases in my career where I found this more useful, easier to use than commenting out code. Just a tip for you, if you want to use it, you can use it. There will be times where you say, oh, I don't want to comment this all out and just uncomment it. This will be a lot easier to add one line at the beginning, one line at the end, instead of having to comment out code, etc. The hash error preprocessor directive. So what is the hash error and why we want to use it? The hash error directive emits a user-specified error message during compilation, and then it stops compilation after that. For example, if you don't want your code to be compiled on Linux or Mac, if your code only runs on Windows, in that example, you would say, if not defined Windows, hash error, and this is where hash error is useful, this code can only run on Windows. The preprocessor does the following. It starts pre-processing, it finds the F statement. If it hasn't seen a definition for Windows before, for example, you're compiling on Mac and this was not defined, then it will execute the hash error by showing this message as part of the compilation output and then it stops compilation immediately after that. So this is how we use the hash error preprocessor directive. That's it for this lecture. See you in the next lecture. Stringify and concatenate operators. The stringify operator or hash operator. The hash operator, or also known as the stringify operator, is used to turn a macro argument into a string, also referred to as stringify or stringification. Here's an example. Hash define hello x. Then you say hello, comma, mister, pound x, or hash x. In this case, you're basically turning this into a string. Let's look at this. printf percentage s new line. And we use our macro here that we just defined. Notice that mo is not actually a string. This will expand into the following. The preprocessor will replace that with 
the exact hello Mr. Mo turns this whole thing into a string. So this could be useful sometimes where you want to just take a constant and quickly turn that into a string. The next operator is the concatenation operator. Double hash signs or pound pound is used to concatenate two arguments together. For example, you can define a macro called concat, give it a and b, and then you say a pound pound b. Let's see how we can use it. For example, integer x equals concat 123 comma 456. This will eventually become one value by using this concatenation operator. Now this is useful in some cases. Not sure if this example is very useful, but you might be able to figure out some other examples, better examples to use it. All right, let's switch over to Visual Studio and take a look at how we can benefit from the stringify operator. Okay, so here I am in Visual Studio. Let's go ahead and create a new project. Click on File, New Project. From the New Project window, make sure you have Visual C++, Win32 selected. Go ahead and click on Win32 console application. Let's call this stringify example. Click OK. On this page, click Next. And then on this page here, make sure you have empty project selected because we want to create a C, not C++ project. Then click Finish. Okay, let's add our main.c, right click on source files, add new item, and let's call this main.c. Click add to add it to your project. In this lecture, we're going to see how we can use the stringify operator. Let's assume we have hash define Sunday is zero, hash define Monday is one. Let me just write the whole thing. Let's assume we have the days of the week defined as macros. So now let's say we want to implement a function called print day name and we give it the constant integer of the day and then we want to print out that day name. Typically we would do something like this switch day case Sunday print Sunday for example break then we can copy all thing Monday and then we can continue right to finish them all. Let's assume we have a function like this print day name that we want to print for each of the constants we have the corresponding name of the day. We call it in main by passing in one of the constants. So let's run this and see just how this can work. Control F5. Yes. As you can see, it's printing Monday now. Okay, so imagine this was a bigger list of constants, then this would become really tedious to do. To make our lives easier and to simplify this code, we can use the stringify macro, hash define day name x to be hash x or pound x. Let's get rid of this and come here and make this simpler by saying printf, for example, day is percentage s, and then we can say day name one day. We'll compile this and run it. As you can see now it says day is Monday. This is useful for tracing and debugging and turn a constant into a string quickly by using this trick. Also, we can simplify this and make it also a macro. We can do that like this. Define print day name x to be, I'll copy this code here. Get rid of this and just put percentage x here. If you leave the semicolon here in the macro definition, it can cause a lot of compilation errors. So now print day name to be, for example, for Monday. Let's see this. Ctrl 5. Now it says day is Monday. Of course, we can say now day Friday, because today is actually Friday. And now it says day is Friday. All right, so that's how we can use this operator. Lastly, let's look at how we can use the concatenation operator and just have some fun with it. Let's say has to define print concat a and b and if concat concatenated with b and we can say print concat one two with three four five run this now as you can see it's concatenating one two three four five however if I try to make this as a string it's obviously not a string if I do percentage s here I'm going to have a compilation error. Now, as you can see, it says the printf requires argument of char pointer. 
but the type is integer. So apparently this is concatenating two integers. To make it into a string, you would have to stringify each one. So we'd say stringify A and then stringify B and then concatenate the two. Let's see if the spaces are allowed or not. Control Shift B to compile. Looks like spaces are allowed, but they're optional. You can also do it this way, but it may not be as readable. So you could do it this way. Now, these are treated as strings instead of numbers. So we can simply here say, for example, Mo Joe. Run this. And now it's concatenated Mo Joe. Or we can even say Monday, just for fun. Run. And now it's concatenated Monday. So that's how you could use concatenation operator along with the stringification operator together. Alright, that's it for this lecture. See you in the next lecture.